I'm humbled to be here today and be given the privilege to speak to you wherever you are. We are speaking to you from Nairobi Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know some of our audience are as far as South Africa. I got a call from one from Canada. We want to welcome you. And those who are here today, our theme for this day is a question. I was given this question to handle it. The question is, is tomorrow scary? When we look at tomorrow, what comes in our mind? We have been spending the whole week talking about cities. Nairobi is one of the cities. Cities are known of having nice buildings. Some of the best things that are found in the world are in cities. But we saw this week that those nice places can be very deceptive. Cities can be very deceptive. They hide people who are lonely. Inside those cities are lonely. Inside those big offices are people who are lonely. There are people who are sick. There are people who are now in their old age. They are being dressed. Uh, they cannot be able to do anything by themselves. There are people who are depressed. There are people who are heartbroken. There is somebody I'm speaking to who is contemplating suicide. I want to speak to you now and say, I have good news for you. There is somebody who has lost a job. And there's somebody who has just discovered, he didn't know, that the certificates that he's having were fake. And the boss has just told him that you have to leave. And therefore, salary will be stopped and the pension benefits might go. Almost every home, you will get an employed youth. They are there. There is somebody listening to us whose business is not doing well. He cannot even be able to make simple payroll take effect. Cities hide people of various types. There are people who are heavy in the debt. I'm standing here today to let you know that that is not how God put it. Cities are God's vineyard. But that's not enough. I want to believe that perhaps the greatest fear is not so much what we are, what we are lacking. The greatest fear is the change that is going to come in the fourth industrial revolution. I want you to know, my people, that when the future comes, things will not be the same. I remember um, that billionaire, Billy Gates, in Santiago Summit. He was addressing fingers, people, the brains in IT. He made a statement, and I want to quote him. He said, IT, or artificial intelligence, will soon replace all teachers. That's what Bill Gates said. And when such a people say something, it means they are going to replace all teachers, the artificial intelligence. If that is true, then the ripple effect cannot be imagined. We may have Kenya National Union of Teachers now controlling the robots. The world is coming. Things are changing. Owners of automobiles may have to think afresh. Vehicles as we know them are going to be electric. People are thinking ahead. Things are changing. Order of life as we know it. Even the church we may have to come and redefine 
what worship is. We may have to redefine the work of the usher because we may have apps that will be welcoming people. Who knows whether even preaching would be replaced? Artificial intelligence is coming. If this is true, as they are telling us, if this is true, how sure are we of tomorrow? If, for example, affordable housing takes place, I would like to assure you that our young people will be the first to take that opportunity. And we might be the last old people holding on to our house in the countryside. Things are changing. They are going to come. Are we prepared? That's the question they're asking. The world is looking into a new face of humanity, the fourth industrial revolution has already taken place. The bus has already left. Traditional jobs, as we know them, are going to go. Traditional jobs. Now, today, young lawyers have lost their jobs. Because of the Watson app, I can get legal advice from artificial intelligence. But that's not enough. Even nurses, we now have software that can do more accurate as a uh, um, diagnosis than even a human being. You may not believe it. When we talk, this may look like a dream, but things are coming. Things are changing. When we look at tomorrow from that perspective, the question I, is tomorrow scary. You can guess what the answer is. But I'm standing here today to let you know one thing that tomorrow does not belong to you. Be tomorrow belongs to God. He's the author and the finisher of our lifetime. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. I want to let you know that those care how tough things may be, God is still God. There are some things that will never change with the time. Sin will re still retain its definition. Salvation will still be only through the blood of Christ. The gospel will still remain the good news of what God did for us in Christ outside our contribution. I want to let you know, whoever is listening to me, wherever you are seated, as you listen to me now, I've not brought you a threat. I've brought you hope. I've brought you a confirmation from God himself that he's greater than anything else. God is faithful. He who created the universe he who gave his son, how will he fail to be with us also? Our walk, our confidence is not based in the things that we have. Our future is not depends on man-made things. Our future is built on Christ himself. Sometimes we look around and we wonder, is this why what we were created for? My answer is, you were created for the glory of God. God is not only our creator. He's also our savior. He's also the great physician. I'm speaking to somebody who may be sick, somebody whom the doctors have pronounced that you may not live long. I'm speaking to, to a parent somewhere that is in his old age and is being dressed in up by a child somewhere. You know, it is in your old age that you come to know who your children are. You will always get one child that will remember you. The others are only scotting. And I want to let you know that one day, you will come and find that it is true. I want to thank God on behalf of somebody 
who is taking care of the mother or the father who left this morning to come for worship. I want to tell you that thank you for that ministry. As young people, we are concerned about God's voice in the cities. We are concerned about God's presence being felt in the cities. We are concerned with the plan that God has for us in the cities. When you look at the book, the book of Romans, by the way, Romans is not a book. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the believers in Rome. That time, Rome was a powerful city. When it is the clearest, if you have it, it's the most systematic. It's the clearest gospel of all. In it, Paul defines the gospel as the incarnation, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. He defines the gospel as the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's how he defines it. These are the pillars of the gospel of Christ. You cannot undo them. And you cannot err on them. The second coming is the hope of the gospel. Is the ripple effect of the resurrection of Christ. That now that he has resurrected, now that he has ascended, we know he will come back again. So when we look at Romans, that great letter, our key text came from Romans 8. Romans 8 is a continuation of Romans chapter 7. When Paul wrote, there were no chapters or verses. The chapters and the verses were inserted in recently to make reference much easier. But because of time, I want us to look at chapter 8. When you look at chapter 8, especially when you come to verse 31, there is a series of questions that Paul is asking. And these questions are meant to ease, to remove our fears, to give us the confidence. Please look at chapter 8, verse 31. From th verse 31 up to verse 35, you will find question marks. If you count them, and if I'm not wrong, there should be about seven of them. Look at what he says. They all ask the same thing. It's one question, but given different ways. Please look at verse 31. He says, what shall we say then to these things? When he talks of these things, he's talking of the things that God has done for humanity. God has demonstrated that he's biased in favor of man. God has demonstrated that his love for man is irreversible. God has demonstrated in John 3.16 that he so loved the world that he gave. He didn't lend, he gave. One writer says in a book entitled The Self Ages, chapter one, he says, God gave his begotten son to become a member of the human family forever. That's what he says. It means when he took humanity, it was irreversible. Even God himself laid aside the power to reverse it. So he became permanently a member of the human family. Even death on the cross could not separate him. Even resurrection, he really resurrected, but still with the human form. Paul is saying, what then shall we say to these things? When he died on the cross, he tested death that no human being has ever tested. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Please, it is sin, singular, not plural. And no human being has ever tested the wages of sin. You may be going through the common death 
which are consequences of what we are. But the wages of sin, the only one who tested that was Christ at the cross. And he cried, and he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakithan. My father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from hearing me? I'm reciting Psalms 22, verse 1 and 2. He tested that pain. We know that he tested that because Paul tells us in Hebrews, Hebrews 2, I think verse 9, he says he tested death for everyone. So Paul says now that he died for us, now that he, 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 he gave his life, when he died on the cross, he was declaring to the world that I don't love you this much. I don't love you this much. I love you this much. And they stretched their hand and he died. If you want to know how much God loves you, don't look at the physical things that you have. Look at the price that he paid on Calvary. He gave his life for us. We may carry stigma, sti we may be stigmatized by our conscience, by people, by communities, but we are, we are precious in the hands of Christ. We may be a street children somewhere. You may sometimes feel broken, but I want to let you know that God is faithful. Paul is saying, what then shall we say to these things? He speaks about these things in a better way in chapter 5 of Romans. Let me go back a bit to chapter 5. If you look at chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, now that we have been justified by faith, we have the following blessings. Number one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first uh, blessing that comes to a believer a realization that he has already justified us through the blood of his son. Therefore, we have peace. The first peace is not peace between you and your brother. When you see horizontal peace is broken, you know there's a problem with the vertical peace, peace between man and the God. So he says, number one, we have peace with God. And that peace is not through your performance. It is through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reading Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. Then he says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And we not only have access, but he says also we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And the verse 3 says, not only so, but we also glory in tribulation. So the Bible says that God himself has already prepared and packaged and delivered our peace in Christ Jesus. When you go ahead in verse 6, he says, for when we were yet without strength, in a due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I love that verse. What Paul is saying, that Christ died for us, not when we were good, but when we were still wicked. The reason why Paul is saying this is because he's saying, if God loved us while we were still sinners, don't you think that now we have accepted him he will love us even more. That's what he's saying here. He goes on to say in verse 8, God commented or demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. Hey, look at verse 8. Christ died for us. And then he says, much more than now that we have been justified by his blood, tomorrow is secure. We shall be saved from the wrath through him on the judgment day. And therefore we know that through Christ, we know that the judgment that will come 
will be pronounced in favor of the saints. Because we know that the one who has been given power to judge is the same one who died for us. I want to speak to somebody somewhere who, has, who is going through a very difficult situation. I want to speak to you and tell you, you are not what your conscience tells you. You are not what people say you are. I want to speak to somebody who wants to hurt a family, that those innocent children, that innocent mother, that innocent wife, they were bought by the blood of Christ. For the sake of Christ, preserve them. I want to speak to somebody listening to me who has forgotten the role of a husband and a wife. I want to let you know, a good husband is the one who does not inspect his wife's phone. A good wife is the one who does not inspect the husband's phone. If you think I'm not saying the truth, I wish you good luck. You have no, you have no inbuilt shock absorbers to read some of the things that are there. And I want to let you know that God did not create us to be inspectors. They, he created us to be our brother's keeper. And I want you to know that God is not inspecting us. God has shown publicly that he is biased in favor of us. Because of that, we know tomorrow is secure. I want to speak to somebody who is listening to me somewhere. Raise up your eyes and look up. Our forefathers had similar challenges, but they endured until the end, and we have been born. Let's go back to Romans 8. Because of time, I will scan through. Paul says, what shall we say then to these things? These things are referring to the mystery of the gospel. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, and this is a conditional sentence. In English, it means in if, if God be. But the conditional sentence here, it means, it's like saying, if you are an African, so you don't begin inspecting yourself if you are an African, you are already an African. So here he's saying, if God be for us, which means he's already for us, who can be against us? That's the question he's asking. When we enter tomorrow, answering that question, we have no fear. He goes on to say, he that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all, how shall he not fail with him also freely give us all things? He's saying God is faithful. We know him having given us his son, if I give you my Mercedes-Benz, do you think if you ask me for a bicycle, I will give you? Yes. How do you know? Because I've given you the greatest. So if God gave us his son, how will he fail to give us the golden streets in heaven? Who, which is greater, his son or the mansions? Paul is saying here, how will he fail? to give us the remaining, the eternal life and everything. In verse 32, freely give us all, not some, all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? He says it is God that justifies. It is God who is supposed to pass the judgment, but instead it is him who justifies us. I want to speak, I'm speaking to somebody who may be feeling guilty, somebody who may be feeling broken at heart. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, he said, if your conscience condemns you, God is greater than your conscience, and he knows all things. So Paul, Paul here says in verse 34, 
Who is he that is supposed to condemn us? Rather, it is Christ that died, and it is him again who rose because of us, and he is seated at the right hand of God, and he is making intercession for us. Because of these things, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He's not talking about your love for Christ. He's not saying, who will separate my love for Christ? Your love for Christ fluctuates. It is today high, tomorrow is low. He's not talking about that. He's talking about God's love for us. He says that love for us does not fluctuate. Who will separate us from God's love that is to us in Christ? Who will do it? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness, shall peril, shall sword, shall unemployment, shall fear of death? What, will, he, will that succeed? He says in verse 37, no, in all these things that bring you this good news, we are not just mere conquerors. We are more than conquerors in him who loved us. Can you say amen? And therefore, because of who God is, because of what he has done for us, we are highly exalted than Adam before he sinned. What we get in Christ is much more than what we lost in Adam. We know that we have not only been exalted, but at the second coming of Christ, you know what the Bible says? The dead will resurrect. Almost every home has a grave. That grave is not permanent. It will break for the dead will come out. Jesus said it in John 5 verse 28. Do not be amazed. The dead will hear his voice and they will come out. But that's not all. We have a God who is a great physician. We have a God who has never, who heals us. In, in Psalms 103, 103, if you read verse 3, it says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he says, he forgives all our iniquities. And then he goes on to say, he heals all our diseases. I'm praying that the Lord will touch your heart. The Lord will raise you. The Lord will make you a hope for the family. The Lord, the Lord himself will open your eyes to see that what connects us to God is greater than that which disconnects us. And I want to pray that this week as we continue, may you be able to walk as you look up. The Lord is faithful. Paul says nothing will separate us from his love. His love is constant. His love is directed to us. If there's anybody among us who's feeling bitter, look at Christ who gave his life for us. If there's anybody who's broken at heart, listen to the words of Christ, that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to set you free, that from here you'll be able to rejoice in what God has done and to be able to say goodbye to all the fears is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.